This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. And by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell Counterparty, Gems, Swarm, Dogecoin, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io and instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. And we're here today with Nathaniel Popper. Nathaniel Popper is a writer for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and he's written a book that just got out named uh, Digital Gold. Uh, and yes, I, I was going to hold it up as well. You know, if you have like a print book, this looks really cool. But, you know, but <laughs> with a Kindle, <laughs> don't get the Kindle, get the book on the Kindle. Um, and so we, we just finished reading it, uh, both of us, and it's, it's been really fantastic. So we're super excited to have Nathaniel on. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you guys for having me. And I, I'm surprised that as, as, as Bitcoin lovers, you would be so still enamored with print books. I mean, come on, guys. No, this is, no, no, this, this, is, is, a, future. this is a, this is a Kindle. <laughs> I know. I know. You're, 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 it's like, it's not cool to hold up an electronic book. That's even well, better. It's, it, it, at least it's not as like, uh, it's not you as graphic. You couldn't have done that years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I just want to point out by, by by Brian saying we just finished reading it. I actually got my copy less than forty eight hours ago, and I've been reading it nonstop. And I finished reading it probably about fifteen minutes before we came on live. So. Man, I'm sorry. It's, to your it's all fresh. I've got so many questions. <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah. So I mean, before we dive in, so what I really loved about this is that there's just all these stories behind the all these little stories about the history of bitcoin right because i mean most of us have you know heard about mount cox heard about silk road and and know maybe a lot of things about it but there are all these like who exactly was there who was talking with whom how did it exactly happen uh so you write about all those things and you've talked with all those people and that was just so interesting and so enjoyable for me uh, so yeah, I, I absolutely I loved it because it just gives you this different perspective. It feels like you're sort of behind the scenes of, of the history of Bitcoin. And, and they're just, they're, I mean, it's a great story, first of all. Bitcoin's a great story, but there are so many great stories within that bigger great story, uh, you know, even more so than I anticipated when I began this project. And that's that's what made doing this book so much fun and i hope it's what makes reading it so much fun there's there's a whole lot of great stories that i ended up having to to leave out of here just to try to streamline it but um it's it's you you certainly picked up on something that i felt in reporting it no totally i mean i think that's one of the things i came away with as well is like just a, such a, a wealth of uh, interesting strange uh, and different people and interesting situations and scenarios and crazy stories and uh yeah I'm, I'm sort of i mean i think obviously that a lot of that is just how bitcoin happened so we i was we were talking i and sebastian were talking about this before is like you know is this mainly uh you doing a really good job as a writer that people come across as, as so interesting or is this yes. just the bitcoin space absolutely uh, <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no these these people are interesting on their own and that was why i decided to write the book i mean i as i began reporting it um it was it and we can talk about this more but it was as I talked to people and got to know the people, it was actually the people that convinced me to write the book rather than the technology. And so tell us, how did you get involved with this in the first place? How long has this project been going on for? How did this come about? Well, um, my, my first story about Bitcoin was, I, I wrote in March, actually, I think April 2013, so pretty late in the game. Um, and actually, the first story was about the Winklevoss twins and their hoard of Bitcoins, um, at, which hadn't previously been public. And it kind of came out of the closet with us, so to speak. And um, that was a story I kind of wrote 
you know, nobody had been covering this at the Times, and there hadn't been too much interest in it. Um, and that story just generated so much feedback. It was the most read story in the New York Times for a while that it kind of woke me up to the fact that there was something interesting going on here. Um, and in any case, I, I, I sort of continued covering it for much of the next year and um, ended up signing a book contract in a, almost a, exactly a year later in March of 2014 um, and, you know, we, it was a long process of how I got to the point where I wanted to write the book. Um, but, uh, once I, once I got started, I took a, a leave of absence from the paper here. And, uh, for basically the first three months of that, I just traveled around reporting. So I, obviously some of that I could do in New York. I mean, I went to visit Charlie, who, Charlie Schramm, who was under house arrest at the time. And I got to spend a bunch of time with him and some of the other New York characters who are important, like the, the Winklevoss twins. But um, I spent a bunch of time out in the Bay Area. I went to Japan. I went to China. Um, I went to Argentina um, and just sort of uh, immersed myself in this world. Oh, that's really fascinating. And what, what, what I thought was really inspiring about this book is I, it, the, the, these people that, that you talk about in, in this book, these people that you write these stories about, that's what they were doing. They were also traveling all, all over the world, and I, I thought that was just really inspiring. And, and in fact, after reading the book, I was like, man, I want to start a Bitcoin business, <laughs> like a Bitcoin startup. That was, uh, that was I think, one, as I was mentioning, one of the things that sort of convinced me to do the book was seeing the, 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 the degree to which people had sort of left their old lives behind to pursue this thing, you know, to pursue this, this promise that seemed to lie within this technology. And, and actually, I, I have to give Charlie uh, Schrem credit because it was, a, it was a day that I met with him at a bar, uh, his, a bar that he had invested in along with some of his Bitcoin um, and I met with him and Nick Carey at Blockchain. And this was actually just like two weeks before Charlie got arrested. Um, and the two of them sort of talking about how this pursuing Bitcoin had just changed their lives um, made me realize there was something deep there that I needed to understand and didn't I, understand. I think, that's, I, I think that's the case for a lot of people working now working in this industry. I mean... A lot of people that we've talked to uh, ha came about it in some way from hearing about it by a friend, or it was definitely the way that I came into it, and, uh, and I think Brian as well. So, I mean, for the most part, I, th I think that story is it r will um, will people will resonate with that story. Yeah, and, and I think. I guess this is similar, yeah, for Charlie Shemnicke and then yeah, a lot of us, including, you know, myself, for example, you know, you, you start seeing this thing and understanding, you know, what Bitcoin is and just what it can do. And, and I think you, you pay, you, you do a great job at sort of showing the belief that people develop in, in the potential of this. And, and it was the same thing with me, right? And then it's just like, well, why would I focus on anything else but that? It just makes complete sense. And, and then I guess for the, especially right. for the people who were so early, right, it's, it, that just, of course, had then also no, like all kinds of other dramatic implications, including like some people getting extremely rich and uh, or starting to work on these uh, revolutionary projects. I think it shut down. I mean, I, I think also one of the interesting things that I often think about in the context of Bitcoin is I have some old Bitcoin magazines, and if you look at the companies there, none, but basically the only one, you know, who were advertising back then, the only one that's still around is generally BitPay, and everybody else is, is gone, you know, and I think that's also just shows how much crazy transformation has been going on in such a short time. Yeah, absolutely. You've sort of been through different generations of companies. Um, I mean, I think there are, I'm trying to think of companies from back then, I think actually Bitstamp is uh, is one of the older ones that's still around, and there there are a few other names like that. Kraken, actually Ripple got started all the way back way then, but 
But um, but you're right that that a lot of the names that were kind of leading this for a long time are are not are not around anymore. Yeah, it was obvious to me when a lot of the names in the book. I mean, I wasn't even aware of <laughs> some some of the some of the earlier failures. Uh, I had never heard of myself. And 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 some of these characters who are who are no longer around and yet who I think without, uh, you know, Bitcoin might not exist. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, and I think that's another thing. I mean, I, I knew that in the beginning it was, there was not very much interest, but it, it's just, I wasn't aware that there was like so little, you know, there was literally like <laughs> two people for like six months or something. Right. So, right. Um, I mean, but, yeah, the, the, that, 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 the two early characters who I focus on, we can, we can get back to them, but, but Hal Finney and Marty Malmy, but Marty particularly fascinates me just because, you know, he largely started working on this basically because he didn't get a summer job in college. And I think if he had gotten a summer job, you know, I don't know if Bitcoin would have stayed alive during that summer. I mean, it was basically just Satoshi um, and there weren't really too many other people who were willing to put in any time. So, uh, you know, little things like that that are sort of fascinating yeah, to look yeah. back at. So before we, we get, get into some of the content, the title of your book is Digital Gold. Why did you choose that title? Well, um, it, it, some of it is, 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 is purely practical. I actually, when I uh, sold this book, it, it was called Making Money. Um, and, uh, and actually my publishers felt that that, it, it was, you know, it's kind of this pun but they didn't feel that it was a strong enough statement. And so we kind of went through alternatives. And I didn't particularly want Bitcoin in the title. I didn't want to throw people off. We wanted to give some sense of just like this sort of universal idea. Um, and, and I think um, digital gold sort of has that sort of boldness to it. So it's, you know, partly just a matter of publishing taste. But, but I think that... Um, you know, as I came to understand it more, I, there are a few metaphors that I have used to explain Bitcoin. And, and to me, that's kind of the first one. That's the simplest one to understand. It's this scarce digital asset. And, um, and it's a way for people to begin to understand what this is. So, you know, no better way to sort of start it than with that idea. One, uh, two, two things that came to my mind when I, I heard the title and, and as I read the book and that I think that make a lot of sense for me is one is the idea of this gold rush, right? This is like land of opportunity where you can go and there's like this promise of enormous riches and people like leave their old lives behind and go there. Yeah. And, and then of course also with the gold rush, right? If you think back, there was, you know, people leaving the east of the US, go to the west and, and, this idea of a sort of a new frontier, right? Like a, you step into this unknown. And, and I think with Bitcoin, that's, and you risk that's a lot. the way, yeah, you risk a lot. And, and, and not, everybody, not everybody finds those, those gold nuggets that they set out for. Yeah, absolutely, right? So was that intentional to, to, to write the book, especially the beginning of the book, as though it was some sort of a gold rush? Um, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's actually th to go back to this question of how the book came about. I actually, uh, agents were approaching me about writing a book. Um, and I, uh, because I was writing about it and I'd found these sort of interesting characters to talk about. I wrote a story about the Winklevoss twins. I wrote a story about this Bitcoin mine in Iceland that people got really into. And, and so around those stories, agents approached me and said, you know, you should write a book. This would be a great book. And I, and, and I initially just said, no, you know, this is too fleeting. There's not, there's not enough here. And it was actually my colleague here, Andrew Sorkin, who um, he's the guy who wrote Too Big to Fail. And he's a, he's a, um, he works for the Times. He's also a TV host. But he pulled me into a room at one point uh, after one of these stories. I think it was after Charlie got arrested. And he... He said, you have to write a book. You have to do this. And I said, yeah, I'm just, I'm not sure. I don't think, I don't think there's enough there. And he just said, you know what? You just have to tell this like a gold rush story. This is a gold rush story. This is people <laughs> just chasing this thing. And, and that night I kind of still said, nah, you know, 
And, but that night I went home and talked to my wife and that, that phrase literally was what made me realize, okay, there's a story, you know, there's a book to write here, not just like a, oh, what is this technology? Does it matter? It's a tale, you know, it's a story. And so very much that was uh, the inception of this. And, and it, it just so happened that I, I, I was a part of this moment in the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, this this event at uh, at a vacation house of this old uh, Goldman Sachs guy that happened to be in the midst of where the old gold rush was. Um, literally, Truckee, California, is where a lot of that you know 1849 gold rush was, and uh, it ended up being the scene where I began the book. Um, but that was that was probably more an accident, but a very happy accident. Yeah, how did you end up there? That's uh, I mean. For the people who haven't read the book, right, that's when you, uh, that's the house of uh, Dan Moorhead, who's is the head of Pantera Capital, and Pantera Capital has, uh, has invested in a lot of Bitcoin companies and, and done, I guess, been one of the most active sort of financial uh, institutional investors in the space. Yeah. So uh, how yeah, did you... Yeah, and that was, yeah. that, that, uh, they, they, they've done a couple of these events that they call Bitcoin Pacifica there, where they bring together, you know, the elite. And so that was where I met Nick Zabo. Um, and, you know, when I was there, Jed McCaleb was there. And, and Roger there was at one of them. He wasn't at the second one because he'd renounced his American citizenship. But um, all these characters going back, you know, Bobby Lee from China and, you know, people from New York. So, um, I, you know, I kind of got lucky. Uh, they, they asked me to come out to that. They haven't otherwise had journalists there, but they knew I was working on this book and, uh, it was, uh, it was a pretty great scene to get to witness. How, how did it feel to be there? I mean, it must, it must've felt like you were among, that, that you were witnessing something happening, like right? a, a changing of, Change, yeah. somewhat, it's changing up the guard from the, you know, the, the previous financial world to like into the new financial world. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why that scene was so evocative and why I began the book with it. Um, you know, here you had these, this Wall Street guy who'd kind of gotten excited about Bitcoin, um, Dan Moorhead, who runs Pantera. And he'd invited a bunch of his sort of hedge fund bank guys. So there was a, a people from some of the largest banks who were there. They even had some regulators there. Um, but they invited and flew in all of these old school Bitcoin people like Eric Voorhees and Jed McCaleb and, because they wanted to learn from them. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of the tensions throughout the book, but, you know, to what degree is it those early people who are kind of guiding Bitcoin versus this new generation of uh, Wall Street and Silicon Valley people who, you know, might have a different vision for it. Um, but, uh, you know, you could see that conversation happening there. And uh, certainly a lot of the old guys were very excited that it had brought them to this place where they could be flown around on private jets and catered to and you know go on private skiing runs with uh, olympic gold medalists and stuff like that which was part of that weekend as well yeah and and, and let's not mention all the apparent um trips to strip clubs in this book <laughs> which <laughs> seems to be one of the main things that these guys like to do with all their money well uh you you might even be referring to the sex club rather than just a strip club. It gets a little bit better than a, just a mere strip club. But what's that? Yeah, that was a, that was in Vienna, um, where there's a, a, I guess a famous sex club, and and uh, the crew went out. The Bit Instinct crew went out to that one night. Um, I actually I, I will I'll I'll, def, I'll you know defend these guys to their wives that. I will, that, that wasn't such a, such a common thing. And, you know, the way that came about in Vienna may have been somewhat unique. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, one of the things that struck me not to be a sort of, uh, 
uh, well, the, one of the things that struck me is the degree to which people were happy to sort of just sit around all night and talk about Bitcoin rather than going to a strip club. I mean, that, that, that certainly happened, but, um, you know, obviously part of, part of what's so amazing about this is, you know, the degree to which people can just sort of talk about Bitcoin endlessly. This episode is brought to you by Ledger. And we've been talking and we will talk a lot in this episode about Mt. Gox. And it's such a pivotal story in the whole Bitcoin history. And if it's taught us, if it has taught us one thing, it's don't trust with your Bitcoin wallets and a huge amount of Bitcoin to some dubious people who have no clue what they're doing in countries far away. No, you can do it differently. You can store it yourself. And the traditional way of doing this was you ordered a secondhand laptop online, you set up Linux, got an extra CD, then sent a copy of your hard drive to your grandmother, dug a hole in the basement where you hit uh, another hard drive, and, and then you printed a lot of paper copies of some seed, and, and you mailed those to your grandfather where he hit them somehow. It's not the most smooth way. It is an option. But Sebastian has a better one. This is what I sleep with at night. This is the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. The Ledger Nano hardware wallet is a smart card wallet that is, uh, you plug it into your USB drive and you can use your wallet on your computer even if it's pest filled with malware, your Bitcoins will remain, will remain safe. They use industry standard security. And the nice thing about the Nano is that they're always improving it. So whenever there's a new feature, they just update the firmware and boom, you've got the new feature and you don't even need to, um, to get a new Nano or anything, it's all built in. And you know this thing is so secure that the Belgian police are using it to store Bitcoins that they've seized. So there you go, Belgium is using it. So we have a special offer for you. If you go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EB09 at checkout, you'll get 10% off your first order. So there's no point in waiting to get a secure setup. And by the way, that offer code is valid until uh, September 30th of 2015. So go to ledgerwallet.com and give it a try. And we would like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. In, in your book, you focus a lot on, on the people and the stories. Why did you make that choice? I mean, we've touched on it maybe a little bit, but... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, just practically as a journalist, part of what I saw as I began to cover this was that um, articles where people sort of talked about the technology in dry terms didn't seem to be particularly captivating or compelling. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you hear about this and you're trying to figure it out and it just it ends up being off-putting. Um, and I found, you know, my first story was about the Winklevoss twins and you, you have these people through which you understand this. Okay, they own it. What does it mean that they own it? And, you know, what do they do to get it and how do they hold on to it? And suddenly you put it into the physical world of real people and it starts to become comprehensible. Um, and I found the same thing, you know, when I went to this, this mining operation in Iceland you know, when you talk to people about how Bitcoins are made, it, it's, you know, people's eyes glaze over, they, they can never understand it. But you say, okay, there's a bunch of computers that are sitting in a data center in Iceland, and they're really hot. And why are they hot? And what are they doing there? Um, you know, why did they, why, why did this guy choose to do it in um, Iceland? And, and suddenly you start to have a way to talk about things. And, um, and that was, um, you know, I think that's what my colleague here picked up on when he said you should write a book. This, this, this complicated topic that everybody's sort of fascinated with, they get bored when they read about the sort of technical specifications of it. But when you start talking about the people, you understand, okay, here's why people care about this. You know, it, you, the reason this is interesting is because people care about it. If people didn't care about it, it would have died a long time ago. And so you kind of start with that human emotion and it becomes a lot more approachable. So one of those people, and of course the, the, the first person uh, is Satoshi. And you also made an interesting argument. We're certainly not the first person to make that, but that Satoshi is Nick uh, Sabo. Can you, what, what has your impression been of, of this Satoshi, uh, that, that character or that, that, that mythical figure in, in, the, in the Bitcoin story? 
Well, um, just uh, just you know, to to be clear, I mean, my, I I I sort of end the book uh, with the sense that Nick Zabo does seem to be the person that most most educated Bitcoiners kind of think it, think of as the best candidate right now. The people you know who who are named frequently as Satoshi, and I kind of looked into okay, why is that? I got a chance to meet Nick and talk to him about that. I mean, I'm certainly certainly not sort of saying Nick is Satoshi. I've tried to be very careful about that. But I think Nick's story gives you a window, even if he's not Satoshi, into how these ideas sort of percolated up and came together in Bitcoin. And, um, and again, a, a personal story through which to understand that. Because it, because it was something that you know, really came about over two decades of experimentation. It wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't a bolt out of the blue. It wasn't just Satoshi came out of nowhere and said, here's Bitcoin. You know, it was all of these previous innovations and concepts that were pulled together to make uh, Bitcoin. Um, so, so that's, that's sort of the background on Satoshi. I mean, I, I think, you know, Satoshi is a very vibrant character in this book. I, I, I tried to make clear to everybody from the beginning, you know, I'm not setting out to try to find Satoshi. That's not my goal here. I don't think, uh, Satoshi is actually a central character in the story of Bitcoin as it developed. He was central in the first year and a half, but he was really as central as some other people. And again, if it had just been Satoshi, this thing would have never gone anywhere. It was all the people who decided to use it and care about it that made this into what it is. Um, so uh, I think you know part of the interesting story as it begins is how did Satoshi sort of start to get those first followers, get those first people who... Um, who bought into this and started helping out. And, um, and um, I think in the end, uh, maybe we can get back to this, but in the end, his anonymity, his, you know, the fact that we don't know who Satoshi is, um, has actually been a big help to Bitcoin because um, it's meant that everybody has sort of been able to write their own uh, vision onto Bitcoin, and there isn't some person to stand up and say, "This is what I meant with Bitcoin." Each person can kind of envision it, envision it in their own image and pursue that image. And you know, there are a lot of different images and visions for what this will be. And the fact that there isn't one central person to define it, I think, has allowed that to happen. Well, let me put it like this: If you had to defend the fact that Nick Zabo is not Satoshi, what arguments would you use? <laughs> I mean, if I had to argue that he wasn't Satoshi, yeah. Um, let's think. What are the, what are the best arguments against it? Well, I, I think even in my the the sort of article that I wrote about this, uh, I didn't get to go into this in great detail, but I hint at it. Nick Zabo isn't known as being a crack programmer, uh, particularly C plus plus, which Bitcoin was written in, and so. I think, you know, there's a sense that if it was Nick, he probably had some help with the coding. Um, and, and there are some other sort of smaller details that, um, that people point to. I mean, you know, there's Satoshi. Some of his writing has Britishisms, British spellings of words, and Nick is not British. I mean, I, I think I find that a little bit less compelling because it's pretty easy to decide you're going to spell color differently um, you know, like a British person would rather than an American would, but you know that's there. Um, I think um, I, I don't know. There are some of the sort of quirks in the dialogue that that Satoshi had with early people that you know could suggest that it was someone other than Nick. Um, but uh, you kind of have to dig very far down into the details to, to yeah. get to that. One, one of the impressions I have of Satoshi, and uh, I read recently this, uh, the book of Satoshi, which is like a collection of, of his forum posts, and uh, I always came away with the impression that this guy had really good social skills. He was like somehow very, of course, maybe it's just an online setting and maybe he didn't have those in, in the real world, it's possible. 
But I just always had the impression he he's very good at taking like responding to criticism in a way that like wins the other person over. He's very good at presenting his arguments. A very clear writer. Um, so well, that's yeah. I, I think that's actually some of the strongest reasons that it is Nick Szabo. I mean, he he is he is a, an incredibly sharp writer and good at interacting online, uh, not, I, not from what I understand as good in person, um, but I think a lot of people, and I would actually count myself in this, in this crowd, um, uh, people who aren't, aren't necessarily as comfortable in social settings actually overdevelop their online communication skills to compensate. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I, I often think of myself in, in those terms. So, um, so that's actually, I think, uh, the, the way Nick deals with people, and there is a long history with Nick of his communicating on these message boards, on the cypherpunk boards, on the extropian boards, and he's actually very good at, with that sort of dialogue. So um, to me... Uh, that's, that is true that that's, uh, that's something that you see in Satoshi's writing, but I think it's also something that you see in Nick's writing. Cool. It's also yeah. something that you see, for instance, with, with Mark Carpellis, you know, in, in terms of having yeah. the ability to no, interact online and not having so many social skills. No, no, I disagree. Well, he, I, no, he was Mark certainly Carpellis. more comfortable. Mark was more comfortable interacting online, but he wasn't very good there either. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, well, what, one more thing about the Satoshi story. So that's something I, I sort of got from your book that, that I didn't really see like that before. But I had the impression in your book that this, the whole, a lot of the ideology of this libertarian ideas and of the 21 million being this, you know, finite quantity, that those were sort of not so much his, but brought by people who joined uh, the project, you know, like Marty uh, being one of them, but then others afterwards, and that he sort of promoted those uh, as as primarily as a means to actually, you know, get people to to work on this project and to invest time in it. Um, yeah, it, it, as as uh, I mean, Satoshi kind of evolved as he went along his 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 presentation of it, and he adapted the presentation of Bitcoin certainly. Later on, he did not uh, talk a lot about the ideology, um, and and initially, uh, you know, when he very at the very beginning when he presented um, Bitcoin, he focused on the technical stuff. But um, what one of the things that's interesting looking at the at the writing and interactions with people is, you know, after a month or two when it wasn't really catching on, he began to, in the presentations, focus more on um, the sort of libertarian, anti-central bank uh, potential of Bitcoin and talk, you know, talk to the sort of gold bug mindset that, you know, we have these free spending central banks that are bailing out banks um, and bailing out Wall Street. And uh, there was a kind of shift there to, to emphasize that more. And, and it did indeed draw in uh, Marty Malmi, who's this, you know, this Finnish kid who was very important in the first year and a half in Bitcoin's development. And I think he, one of the things that drew him most initially was that, that sort of gold bug-ish kind of argument. And um, it was that adaptability that I think allowed, again, Satoshi to draw different types of followers at different times. Today's magic word is frontier, F-R-O-N-T-I-E-R. -E Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Can you tell us a little bit more about how uh, Bitcoin evolved after that, maybe after that sort of initial, you know, getting started and getting the first followers? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are sort of a couple of big spikes where I think it gained most of its followers. Um, the first one was, you know, at the tail end of Marty Malmi's involvement, um, there was this item on Slashdot um, that was sort of the first 
media coverage of Bitcoin. And this was uh, like a year and a half into Bitcoin. And up to that point, it had been worth essentially nothing. And Slashdot was where uh, Jed McCaleb found out about Bitcoin and started looking into it and decided to create uh, Mt. Gox and um, a bunch of other important programmers at that point sort of got excited about this idea. That was around the time that Gavin and Dreesen first got involved. Um, and so you saw a first a, a big surge there, and you, that was the first time where you could no longer mine Bitcoins with your CPU and your computer. After that, you basically needed, um, you started to need GPUs, and, and you, know, you, you couldn't just sort of mine Bitcoins at will. And so that was the first big spike. Um, then the next year after the creation of, of uh, the Silk Road um, and the first media coverage of that, you saw a big spike that um, you know, coincided with, with Mt. Gox's rise. And, um, and that, that kind of drove a big uh, increase in the price, which brought on a lot of new people, including a lot of people who um, ended up being important later on. Charlie Schrem, that was when he first got involved. And then there was yet another crash, or, or that was the first big crash, I guess. And uh, then you had another one in, in March 2013, um, where the reasons, I think, are debated. Um, but, you, you know, it sort of moved in these big spikes where the price went up a lot. Suddenly the press got interested. New people read about it and learned about it and sort of got involved and started doing their own things. And it really kind of moved in these cycles. And the last, the last one of those cycles was, I think, you know, the end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, when you had this big China run up and all this excitement in China and then sort of came crashing down with Charlie Shrem's arrest and the, 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 the end of Mt. Gox. And I think it's kind of been a, you know, a, a slide since then. And I think you're sort of waiting for that next big uptick. To, to what extent do you think that uh, the, the role that Mt. Gox played in these crashes, because it seems that in the book, when there are these crashes, Mt. Gox seems to coincide, there seems to be some sort of Mt. Gox incompetence that coincides with them at some point. I, I mean, I think that the, the, the certainly the Mar uh, April 2013 crash was essentially uh, entirely immediately caused by Mt. Gox. And I think that, you know, over the last year, the biggest damage to Bitcoin's confidence, you know, the confidence within the wider world and the interest in Bitcoin uh, was a result of, uh, you know, problems at Mt. Gox. I mean, I think in, in each case, you did have a big run-up before that was likely to um, encounter, you know, likely to come down somewhat. But I, I do think that if you'd had a sort of a more competent business um, in control of all of these Bitcoins at those times, uh, the, the story could have looked very different. It fell entirely to them. And um, I mean, part of what's amazing is that despite, despite the number of times that, that they proved that they weren't up to it, people kept going back there. That is amazing. I mean, I mean that's, that's a, it's certainly, you know, that's true with exchanges is the most valuable thing that an exchange provides is liquidity. And so if people are there, other people have to be there too. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of lure, the inertia of that uh, kept everybody at this place that, you know, had proven itself uh, not up to the task several times. But yeah, that's, that's also something that has really amazed me because when I got into, interested in Bitcoin, it was maybe around May 2013. So it was, you know, after that crash. And, uh, you know, it was, I guess, late, uh, quote, unquote, but it depends. Uh, at the time, Mt. Gox had a terrible reputation. And I was like, I had zero desire to use Mt. Gox. You know, it was already that it, it took a long time to get your money out in fiat. And it was like, so it was like, obviously, you cannot trust that place. And, and there, was other, there was other options, you know, Bitstamp, Bitcoin, e, local Bitcoins, all these places you could go. So it, it is really amazing that people kept using it and never moved their money away because it, you know, for at least a year or more, it was just a sort of a common view that 
Monk Ox is uh, incompetent, maybe uh, has some other problems. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite amazing how much inertia there was in that. And I, and I think that, you know, I, 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 this, is a, this is something we could, we could debate, but, um, and, I, and I think it probably wasn't debated adequately, but, you know, there was often a desire in the Bitcoin community to say that Mt. Gox, the weakness there was not the weakness of Bitcoin. And um, that's true that, you know, Mt. Gox was a centralized institution holding everybody's money and Bitcoin was created for the opposite reason, so as not to rely on uh, centralized institutions. But um, I, I think at the same time, the, the fact that uh, Mt. Gox, the fact that, that Bitcoin was this decentralized uh, uh, technology made it so that there was nobody who could uh, sort of step in and say, you know, this institution should not be operating. It needs to give people its money back. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that was something that wasn't necessarily discussed enough at the time, but it was, I think, to some degree, a weakness of Bitcoin and the way this technology worked that something like Mt. Gox could keep going up to the end in that way. And in the book, you keep coming back to that. You keep coming back to uh, the the initial uh, sort of ide ideological um, ideas like that the Satoshi had that the money sh that Bitcoin shouldn't be in centralized uh, exchanges or shouldn't be kept by by central by companies. Um, and right, I mean, people just kept keeping their money in these exchanges and keep getting uh, gox um, in, at multiple and, occasions. And Keep to continue to this day. It's you know yeah. I, I it's it's I don't know that it's easy to tell, but I would wager that most bitcoins are still held in sort of centralized organizations like Coinbase, Zappo, you know, where you have a third party that is responsible for your money, and you know you go back and look at the at the. Bitcoin white paper, and that's why this was created, so that you didn't have to rely on a third party. So, I mean, there, that's not the only reason Bitcoin exists, but, um, you know, it's, that's true to this day. And I think, you know, this, I, I make this point in the book, but I think there's a degree to which it makes you wonder whether people really want to have control over their money, whether they want, whether they trust themselves enough. Um, you know, even people like Roger Ver, um, Throughout the you know initial years of Bitcoin, he's obviously this um, staunch uh, libertarian. You know, talks about having control of your money, but you know he put a lot of his money in these central institutions. And and the reason people do that is because they don't trust themselves to hold on to their private key, or and because they, want they to put, yeah, or because they, they want to give service. that responsibility to somebody else. And um, and you know. That's that's how that's how governments come about. You know, you want to you want to offload some of that responsibility so it's not on your shoulders. Um, and you know, it's been one of the the central tensions of this whole experiment. So our episode today is brought to you by Shapeshift. Uh, if you are going to read this book, Digital Gold, actually one of the key characters in the book is Eric Voorhees who's brought us this wonderful creation of an exchange where you can exchange coins, but it's actually non-exchange, so you don't need an account, so it's much better. And uh, he's, he's one of the few characters in the book that have sort of survived uh, and have bridged being an early adopter and really uh, advocating this technology and decentralization. And they're still here today and doing things that actually work instead of being in jail, unfortunately, or drinking frappuccinos and getting haunted by angry ex Mt. Gox users. So that's, that's, I think that's a real plus and, and you know, that's, that's something good you know when you use Shapeshift. Well, Brian, I couldn't put it better myself. Very well said. So if you want to trace some altcoins, uh, go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no countersign required. They now support more than 30 altcoins and they're adding new altcoins all the time. So good job guys on providing such a great service. We'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So uh, let, let's talk about the Silk Road story because that also has such a central role. 
I mean, I, I, one of the ways I think about this, right? So if, if you think of, of Bitcoin, uh, most of it is all like potential and, and dreams and aspirations and, and hopes. Um, but they are, in my, in my view, there are like two big successes so far with Bitcoin. And the one is actually sort of the thing you're talking about, right? This is like digital, decentralized, stateless, global asset that just didn't exist before. And, and it has, you know, maybe it's still small, but at least, you know, several billion dollars. A lot of people put a lot of time and money in that. So, you know, that's definitely a success, right? And then the other thing is Silk Road, right? Because otherwise, none of these businesses that exist really have made money or found the business model that, that really works. Uh, and, and Silk Road, you know, was so early on and, and such a big success. Uh, so such, it's such a crucial part of that story. Do you think, do you think Silk Road was in, inevitable? Well, you, I, yeah. I, I think first, first of all, you know, there is a, often a desire now to sort of play down Silk Road and to say, oh, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was never a, a big part of the system and, you know, you over-exaggerate that. I think absolutely, you know, for at least a year or two there, Silk Road was the main way you could use Bitcoin. And, and I think, you know, if you look into the buildup, you know, in the years, really the two years before the Silk Road came about, there was constant discussion on the Bitcoin forums about how are we going to find something for people to do with their Bitcoins? And everybody always came back to porn and drugs because, you know, you needed to find something that you couldn't do with normal money, right? You, with normal credit cards, it's, you, you, online commerce works pretty smoothly for most people. You know, it's not, it's, they're, they're, there's no roadblock to buying stuff online. But what can you not do um, is, you know, buy illegal things. And, and so, you know, Ross Ulbricht, his first message about the Silk Road advertising it was, interestingly, just a continuation of a long forum post or, or a long thread on the Bitcoin forum about uh, creating a heroin store. So this, is, this had been a conversation that had been going on for six months, and there was all this debate about could you create a heroin store in which Bitcoin is the currency? And, you know, people had gone back and forth about why it would work, why it wouldn't work. Here, you know, how are people going to trust each other? And it was into that debate that Ross launched um, the Silk Road. So, you know, I think it was something that people were sort of waiting for. And when it came about, I think people figured out pretty quickly, okay, this is something we couldn't do before. And I think to a certain degree, you're, to a certain degree, you're still waiting for another thing that you couldn't do before that people really start doing. You know, people talk about people talk about remittances, and there are people using it for that, um, but you know, not not in any widespread way. I don't know that anybody's really making money off of that yet. Um, so, uh, it, you know, I think the Silk Road is, is crucial to understanding this story. Well, did you get to talk to Ross Albert? I did not. I, uh, I talked to his family. I talked to people um, who knew him. Um, in the end, uh, in the trial that took place, you had more personal documents uh, on display there than... I had about almost any other character. I mean, the, the amount of things he kept on his laptop that really others haven't mined yet, you know, his, his diaries and his logs of activity. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost easier to know about Ross Ulbrich than it is about anybody else in the Bitcoin project because of the number of things that were captured by the uh, authorities when they arrested so, him. So are these uh, diaries, etc., are they all publicly available? Um, essentially, yes. I mean, they were all entered into the court as, uh, as, as evidence. And, um, you know, I attended the, the trial, and so they kind of distributed them there. Other people have posted a lot of them online, but they're generally available within the court documents for that case. Okay, interesting. What, what I found interesting was, so that in, in sort of the Bitcoin media, when he was arrested and, and, and trial and everything uh, and sentenced, um, 
That's happening uh, my, next my, week. Yeah. So when when, um, when the, the impression that I got from this guy was that you know the Bitcoin media sort of portrayed him as a you know a collateral damage and sort of a victim of the system and you know that he that yeah that he was a victim and mo- made an example. But in the book, yeah, like I read him as like a criminal, you know, like he, whether it, these people got murdered or not, like he intentionally wanted to have these people uh, murdered to protect uh, himself and to protect the business that he had built. What was your impression about him? Yeah, I mean, one of the things you see in the documents, in his documents, is his evolution. I mean, I think at the beginning, um, he was he was very sort of pure in his intentions, um, and um, and and he was very insecure, and he 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 was okay with the fact that you know it was illegal to sell drugs. He he didn't he wasn't bothered by that, but he hated lying to people, and and um, and he kind of evolved over time into this person who it seems in the end was willing to kill to maintain this business. Um, you know, whether or not he did end up, whether, and whether anyone ended up dying, I think is, uh, it, it seems like probably nobody did, but, um, it seems that pretty clear that he was willing to kill, um, for this business. And I think, you know, in the end, um, he was willing to kill in part because he really believed in the, uh, the ideas that this site represented and he thought it was, you know, it was fair for one person to die if it would protect, you know, 5,000 members of his site from getting arrested and going to jail. Um, but I think the debate since he's been arrested, you know, does, there is this division between, uh, running the site and whether that was an admirable thing and allowing people to buy drugs online and, you know, is that uh, is that something that you should admire? And then this other set of issues with you know being willing to kill for the site, and is that something to admire? And I think you you, you know that th- there's frequently a, a divide in people over those you know two separate issues. Yeah, absolutely, and and I, I agree, right? That in a way we are in this Bitcoin community, what everybody is looking for is sort of uh, you know a new Silk Road, I mean, a a legal uh, Silk Road, but that sort of thing that you can't do otherwise. And that gives us such a compelling reason for Bitcoin. And and yeah, that search sort of hasn't, you know, it's the killer app, right? Exactly. And, and, and Silk Road without a question. I mean, my view was the second killer app for Bitcoin, right? The first was the bill wrap as a store of value. Um, Or maybe, yeah, I guess this two kind of went together. Uh, Let's, you know, it, it seems like the Silk Road was, was, was really pivotal in the first part. And then you talk a lot about this transition where a lot of venture capitalists become interested, a lot of Silicon Valley people. And one of the things that really amazed me in the book and that I just wasn't aware of before or not nearly to the extent that Vences Caceres, the CEO of Xappos, was absolutely crucial in recruiting people and convincing people and talking to people with a lot of power and getting them excited about this technology. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about his story and how that yeah. he ended up playing such a role? He was somebody role? who I wasn't particularly aware of when I started writing this book. I didn't realize his significance. Um, and I think in part because you know, the people who were sort of the spokesmen for Bitcoin, people like Roger Ver and, and uh, Charlie Schramm, um, they, the, the, those early folks, uh, they didn't get convinced by, uh, by Wences. Um, and so actually the first time I met him, I almost, he showed up late and I almost sort of walked out and never talked to him. But he actually caught me as I was on my way out of the building and started telling me his story and and started telling me about the um, you know the people he'd convinced sort of quietly long before starting Zappo, and I actually spent that next week in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, and everybody I came across said, "Oh, well, have you talked to Wences? He's the one. He's the one who sort of got all of us excited about this." Um, and it wasn't 
a, a public uh, thing. So it wasn't something you could see on the message boards or at conferences. I mean, he more recently he's spoken at conferences and, and all of that. But this was all kind of in these private exclusive events with Silicon Valley people and Wall Street people. And it sort of began slowly in 2012. He got David Marcus, who was the president of PayPal at the time and a good friend, excited. That was one of the first people he sold on it. And David began buying a lot. And then he got the guys at Fortress Investment Group, which is one of the biggest private equity hedge funds around, um, actually on a hella skiing trip out in Canada. And it kind of went from there. And I think the kind of culmination of that to some degree was March 2013. I mentioned this big spike in price then. Um, and a lot of people at the time attributed uh, that spike to uh, the, the problems in Cyprus um, or there was a, a guidance from the Treasury Department. People kind of thought, oh, that's why the price is going up so fast. Um, I, I think hearing it through Wences and sort of getting to know some of the people who he convinced, what you see is that was the month where there was a conference where he got some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley excited, and they were buying like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, orders that um, I think may have, you know, cumulatively been responsible for that big spike in price, and that's something that people aren't necessarily aware of when they think about that. They think about big world events as having caused that, but... Usually when you look at the spikes in price, it's because somebody put some big orders in and it, and it, and it pushed the price up. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another thing that, I, uh, that really uh, surprised me. I mean, and I think it has been clear for a while that, that PayPal has been you know, aware of cryptocurrencies and interested in, in at least researching it to some extent. But I wasn't aware that you know, David Marcus, uh, is he the president or this... Uh, he was the president. He's not anymore. He's now f at Facebook uh, leading. He was kind of personally recruited to Facebook by Mark Zuckerberg working on their messenger uh, app, which, by the way, is working towards uh, integrating payments. But um, yeah, he first got excited when he was at PayPal and uh, got PayPal into this got, and got the president of eBay, which owned PayPal into it. Um, and and you know developed a pretty big stash of bitcoins himself. Yeah, and and was at the first Bitcoin conference, right? He said so. That's that's really uh, it's really surprising, especially because in in the Bitcoin community, I mean, on the Reddit and stuff, which is I always thought was a little bit nonsensical, but it was always like PayPal sort of painted as this like ultimate uh, adversary, that sort of this force of evil, where you know the pre the president of PayPal is like. At the Bitcoin conference, like we're learning about Bitcoin buying Bitcoin at you know at the same time, so that that was uh, right. He and and one of the funny little elements of the story is that he actually, when he went to that conference in San Jose in 2013, he was so unimpressed by what he saw that he almost decided to quit PayPal and start a Bitcoin exchange. He he just thought this this is such a mess. Somebody needs to uh, somebody needs to to create a professional business with a professional exchange. And he con contemplated it for a few weeks before he kind of decided not to. So as we kind of come to the end of our show, let's talk a little bit about where you see, uh, where you see Bitcoin going. What are your ex expectations over the next, um, the next year or years? Um, well, I, you know, this is, this is the area in which I am the least well informed, and probably you know my my opinions on this are as as valid as either of yours. Um, I mean, I think for one thing, one of the thing places I probably ended up is that it's it this this may take a lot longer than people in the Bitcoin world want it to. Um, I you know, uh, Wences uh, said some memorable stuff on this you know front. You know, he said. If this takes five years, if it takes 10 years, if it takes 20 years, I don't care. You know, this is, this is not about two years from now. This is about 50 years from now. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the, the comparison with the Internet gets tossed around a lot. But it did take a long time before uh, things could be built on the Internet that, you know, ordinary people wanted to use. And so this process does take a while. 
Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on right now. I think certainly the stuff that Wall Street is trying to do could drive real money into this market in a way that hasn't been the case. Um, but uh, I, I think that's going to take a while. And I think that the, the, this idea that we have in the Bitcoin space, that, so first of all, that it's going to take like, as little time as people like to think it, it will is completely nonsensical. And this idea also that there's some sort of finality, like at some point, like we've made it. This is like, you know, the, what we were trying to achieve is also pretty nonsensical because everything is still evolving. I mean, like who says we're at the finality of the internet, right? Things yeah. are still being built. And I, I have a little bit of a different opinion on that. I mean, I think it may take a long time and it's, it's unclear to me how this is going to happen. I mean, it's clear to me, I think that cryptocurrencies and this blockchain technology uh, will change the world in dramatic ways. I don't know. I am a lot less certain whether, you know, Bitcoin will be the new world currency or become the sort of digital gold that, you know, still has value 20 years from now. But one thing I am convinced of is, is a really unique property of cryptocurrencies and of Bitcoin particularly is that sort of inherent uh, virality by giving people this incentive, right? Because, you know, you, you buy into Bitcoin, you all of a sudden have a lot of interest uh, to convince other people and you have a lot of interest to go first which is, I think, is kind of unique because often otherwise with technologies, maybe you rather wait for the people to do it and then go. But with Bitcoin, because of this dynamic that, you know, as more people get interested, the price rises. Uh, it, I th and I think actually that was an absolutely crucial thing too to get Bitcoin started at all was that there was always this possibility there that you work on these really speculative projects that may not go anywhere. But if it does you know, you can become rich. And, and I think that was, I mean, in my view, that must have been a, a, played a crucial role in the early years of Bitcoin and still does. And, and I think that also has the seed in it for this really, really explosive development. Yeah. They may come or may not come, right? But uh, I think yeah. the incentive system is, you know, at the very center of what Bitcoin fi figured out. Um, and Nick Zabo said uh, when I talked to him, he, he said that, you know, he had created this thing called Bitgold before that didn't really go anywhere. And he said what, what Satoshi figured out was a way to get people excited about this and to make people care, and that's the incentives. Um, and the incentives, I think, you know, they're, they're what will make it work if it works. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of other stuff there as well, but um, it's, it's already worked in getting a lot of people to care about this. Maybe, maybe let me throw in here one last point uh, that I, I saw that I thought was interesting. You wrote somewhere that Coinbase at one point uh, had to convince the Silicon Valley Bank that they knew what happened with Bitcoins leaving Coinbase. Do you know what happened with this? Is this something that they are, you know, they continue to have to monitor in order to work with their banks? So that, yeah. you know, this is all, I mean, all the American companies that are large work with Silicon Valley Bank because it's, it's the only bank that will work with anybody. Um, actually, ItBit is different um, now, but, um, but that's, that's the whole danger to, uh, to the banks. That's, that's the reason they're not getting involved is because they're afraid they don't know where it's going and it could be going to Hezbollah or, um, you know, North Korea and they won't know. And so essentially they do allow transactions to take place if they're small, even if they don't know who the other address is. Um, but once they reach a certain limit, they have to be able to know something about who is getting the coins. Um, and so I, I think generally that's going to be done in a way that both parties are aware of. So it's not as though this is going to be um, kept from, you know, it's not as though Coinbase is going to be necessarily secretly keeping track of where the money is going. But I think they and Circle and others, you know, when big amounts of money move, when I, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a hard limit, whether it's $1,000, I think it can sort of move somewhat. 
but um, they 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 have to know that, and that's the only way that they can continue working with their banks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a, we had a podcast. We did a podcast a few weeks ago with um, Michael Gernager, who's doing a startup called Chainalysis that does exactly that, right? That they monitor the blockchain, try to figure out where things are going, so they can, I guess, sell this to companies like Coinbase. Um, so, well, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it was super interesting talking with you. Uh, thanks again so much for writing this book. It was a, it was a true pleasure to read it. And, and to our listeners, I can, I can highly recommend it. I think anyone who's interested in Bitcoin uh, at kind of any level will, will get a lot out of this book and a lot of uh, super fascinating background stories. Thank you, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Um, of course, we'll have to link um, to the book. Uh, in the show notes, so if people want to want to buy it, uh, it will be available there. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, is there some other place people can reach you? Is there a website for the book? Uh, yeah, it, it, just my name, NathanielPopper.com. Okay, perfect. So we'll put and it in the show that, notes. That if people dig, they can find my email address on there. Um, so uh, you know. So if people have other exciting stories to tell you, then perhaps uh, you you could write a second edition. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. So we release new episodes of S7 Bitcoin every Monday. So if you want to, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or in your favorite podcast app. You can also get the show on YouTube at Epicenter BTC. And uh, if you want to, if you like the show, you can always send us a tip and the tipping address will be in the show description. So thanks so much and until next time.